on this episode, Andy is joined by Robert, also known as Mouse's Wrestling Adventures. Welcome to the Road Home from Wrestling interview. Mouse's Wrestling Adventure, also known as Robert. How you doing today, man? I'm great. How are you, Andy? I'm great, you know, as usual. And I, I am the appropriate level of excitement. I'm not too excited. I'm not underwhelmed. So I just want to let you know I'm going to stay on that same level, okay? That's where we need to be, buddy. <laughs> so how do you, how do I know you? How do, how do we know each other? Uh, I think we noticed each other on Twitter and social media, and we met at an IWA show. It's a long time ago at this point, right? I mean, it's been, you know, around three years, I think. Yeah, it was uh, the first configuration of the Memphis building uh, when the wrestling was kind of closer to the front, off to the side before they pushed them to the back wall. Yeah, that's right, man. That was a long time ago. And, uh, We've had a lot of fun ever since, uh, being friends and everything. But, you know, you are a photographer, among many other things. You know, you're the leader of the Lost Boys. Uh, you're the father of uh, Billy Starks, one of the biggest up-and-coming independent women wrestlers out there. Um, and uh, But you're also a photographer, which a lot of people forget sometimes. You know, you wanted to come on here to talk about other photographers. Is that right? Yeah, because other people are better than me. Oh, yeah? Well, you know, just a real quick kind of breakdown. So Robert uh, has been a friend of mine since we met him at IWA Mid-South a long time ago, like I said. And uh, you've been a huge supporter of mine and The Road Home from Wrestling, which is a big deal to me. You know, I really appreciate it. You've given me advice on numerous occasions. And uh, you've been kind of... You know, you're kind of everybody's dad in a lot of ways, and I really appreciate that. I'm not too excited about it, but I'm, I'm you know, uh, I do appreciate it. And that's what I love about you is that you get pro wrestling, and pro wrestling is all about the other person. And so, you know, you said you want to talk about other photographers. So let's start talking about photography and pro wrestling. What makes a good picture, and why are these other people better than you? Uh, they're better to me because their pictures look better. Like, have you ever seen uh, Ian Three Count? His stuff's amazing. Uh, he shoots uh, AW. He's done a lot of backstage stuff for them. Um, he just started shooting uh, Ring of Honor a couple months ago. Shot a show in Milwaukee, Chicago. Just recently did St. Louis, which he then came to Glory Pro the next day and shot tons of backstage stuff and promos. Like, uh, he took an amazing picture of uh, AJ with the title. And uh, like a a trucker hat for the job that AJ does on the side. Um, he just does amazing, amazing work. And it's one of those things that the kid doesn't even realize how good he is. Um, it's the same way with uh, there's Basil, who also shoots up in Chicago. He does AEW. He's been doing a lot of film work uh, backstage for AEW. Um, he's been the primary photographer inside the America for uh, Impact. Um, he does Black Label Pro with me. Um, great guy. Um, then, like, our big dude that we love there would be Michael Watson, uh, Brain Buster Online. Like, he is the one that's created a lot of uh, wrestling books. Um, honestly, when it comes to, like, a pitcher, like, those three guys are very good at what they do because they can tell a story and show emotion through their pictures that they take. Um like one of the coolest books that Brain Buster made was he made a book for ACH before he left for NXT. And it's just a collection of pictures of ACH's uh, career through AAW and different places that him and Michael Watson have both been at. And it, each picture that's in there tells a story of what was going on during that period in time. Um, it, it reminds you of how, Somebody can capture like the emotions of a wedding or something like that. I'm still trying to figure all that stuff out. Like these guys capture stuff that I wish I could capture. Like the first time I met uh, Basil, I just gushed and 
talked to him over and over about a picture he got of Jimmy Jacobs at AEW that I just thought was the most amazing thing in the world. I think I kept talking to him about it, probably to the point of where he didn't want to talk about it anymore. <laughs> well, I, okay, so you told me a little bit about what you think makes a great picture, and that is to capture the moment that's happening, capture the emotion, the story. Um, you know, sometimes that's the thrill of victory and the agony of defeat all in one picture. Um, what is your favorite wrestling picture you've ever seen? <sighs> That's a tough one. Uh, like a picture of Jimmy Jacobs that Basil got is up there because it's it's a great picture. It's uh, when Jimmy Jacobs came back to AEW for the first time. Um, so you got Jimmy Jacobs standing in the ring, dressed only as Jimmy Jacobs can be dressed. Uh, he wasn't in ring attire or anything. He just had like a blazer, like a Jimmy Jacobs S type of blazer on. Then in the background, they had banners and things up of all the former AAW world champions. So like Seth Rollins in the background, things like that. So it's just everything that captured that moment of the crowd being happy that Jimmy Jacobs came back home or to one of his homes. So that's a really great picture. Another great picture that captured my attention was um, – John Moses, which is a photographer out of uh, North Carolina, he shoots uh, NWA, PWX. Uh, he does a lot of the WrestleCon stuff. I believe it was uh, one of the WrestleCon super shows. Um, I don't remember if it was uh, Orlando or New Orleans, uh, but one of them, um, he captured the picture of, uh, it was like the 10-man tag, um, Sammy Callahan's giving somebody a tombstone in the middle of the ring. All the top high flyers you can think of, like Ricochet, people like that, they're doing shooters, like shooting star presses, all at the same time, and he captured that moment. It's an amazing, amazing, amazing picture. Um, so it's just things like that, like the perfect time, he settings were right, his finger hit the button at the right time and he captured a moment that no one else will probably be able to replicate because I've never seen anybody capture a moment like that again. So it's stuff like that where a person's in the right spot at the right time and they do everything at the right time to capture something like that. Those are how, shots that people dream about. How much does experience play into that? Cause you said that one of the guys that you mentioned there at the top you know, he's he's kind of new at it. And you, you said you, he doesn't realize how good he is. But, you know, part of it, I mean, some people would say, oh, anybody can take a picture. But, you know, I think that there's a lot that goes into it that a lot of people don't realize. What are what are some things that like, you know, like experience? How much does experience go into photography? And like, what are some of the things that people don't think about that make it difficult to take a great picture? Well, the one thing that people, especially in wrestling photography, there's a lot going on. Um, you have to be mindful of where the camera people are. Uh, you have to be mindful of where the hard cam is. You also have to be mindful of where the wrestlers are. Um, most recent Rockstar show, I got hit in the face by um, um, Arrow Boy's uh, elbow pad because I'm tucked down in the corner trying to get a picture. He's just taking his elbow pad, throwing it off. I'm trying to get a shot. I'm not paying attention. Smack me right in the face. Uh, so it's stuff like that where your traditional wedding photographer or anything like that, you can't just take them out of the world that they're in and pluck them into this world. It's going to be a learning curve. They're going to have to figure out what settings work best for terrible lighting because it's very rare that you get to have at most wrestling venues. Um, like, uh, at the Glory Pro show that um, Ian came to that he shot backstage at, um, there was a photographer that hasn't ever really done wrestling. You could tell him being new to a lot of stuff because, like, we're all ones that have been shooting wrestling quite often are looking at some of the things that he's doing. We're like, yeah, he has no regard for where placement of things like that is and all of it is because no one's told him. No one's pulled him to the side and said, hey, don't block the Rome cam because they kind of got to get the video for the people to see on, you know, IWTV. Hey, don't walk in front of hard cam, work like a you, 
what I got lucky at is one, I have no history with a camera besides my cell phone before I bought a camera. I had no history shooting wrestling shows besides standing in the crowd once I got my camera and taking pictures. Uh, the biggest help I got was taking the hard words that Nick Manawa said to me and just follow that rule. Um, he told me, stay out of the way of the roam cam, don't go on hard cam, and don't get hit. So that's pretty much what I tried to follow. <laughs> how, uh, did you, how, did, how did you learn to get so good at standing in the way of fans? Uh, that's just, uh, I was told by uh, Maggie, uh, Dave's girlfriend at Rockstar, hey, I'm hired to do a job, and that job's to get that picture. So I'm going to get that picture. So, of course, if I got to block you for a moment to get that picture, it is what it is. Just just for a moment. I mean, you seem to really take that to heart, though. I mean, it, I think that you listened to that advice and you thought, OK, I'm, I'm really going to make sure that I get that picture. If that takes, you know, three matches of standing right in front of me, <laughs> then, hey, you know, I mean, whatever. You, like you said, you got hired to do a job and I'm the mark that paid to go there. So <laughs> it's pretty awesome. Well, OK, so <laughs> so have you ever been interested in the videographer side of things or is it all about still images and why? I, I don't care to do anything but, but take pictures. I don't want to take video. Uh, my video skills are terrible. All you got to do is just look up that uh, IFHY video from uh, where they were on the, uh, the pier or whatever, staring at the Statue of Liberty. You can see how terrible I am at video and holding a camera. It's, it's like I got Parkins or something. I'm shaking so bad. Don't ever <laughs> let me do video. Except for I did do a great job with uh, AJ's recent video where he was uh, telling people he was a dirty motherfucker. <laughs> now you're talking about AJ Gray is who you're talking about, um, and uh, you've uh, you've had a lot of fun interactions with wrestlers that have made their way on the social media and all that kind of stuff. What's more fun for you? Is it um, you know having a, a tremendous picture that you've made and, and you know giving that to a wrestler, uh, you know, or is it making a joke on the internet? Which is more fun for you? Pissing Trey Lamar off. <laughs> So making jokes on the internet. Okay, awesome. <laughs> so Most why do you... likely just Trey, just Trey. Like why everybody do you... else, I don't want to hurt their feelings, but Trey, I want to hurt his. Why Why do you hate Trey Lamar so much? Everybody hates Trey Lamar. Really? Okay. I he's, he I interviewed him once for the show, just a quick interview, and he was really nice. I, I kind of like him. Uh, everybody hates Trey. Look it up. Okay. All right. I'll, I'll look that up on the internet. I'm sure it's out there somewhere. So. Now, your gear has uh, evolved over time. I remember when I first met you, I don't think you were using a flash. And then you went to this, like, globe flash. And then you went to this, like, directional flash thing. Uh, why don't you use a flash anymore? Uh, I honestly like uh, pictures without the flash. So if I can get decent lighting, I will go without a flash. Um, like, initially, I got a flash because the lighting in the arena in Jeffersonville was so bad. Um, if you remember those days where they had uh, just the two gigantic lights. Everything's uh, orange. It, everything's <laughs> orange in there. Like you take a picture of something that's blue and you look at it and it's fucking orange. I don't know why, you know? <laughs> yeah. So everything was really terrible. So I was like, I realized I needed a flash. Then one thing that I did was uh, the first time I went to a Rockstar Pro show, um, which was, I believe, uh, their fifth anniversary, oh, um, yikes. I was That's... watching uh, Maggie take pictures, and she had this deflector thing on her camera. So I messaged her and said, what is that and what does it do? So she explained it to me, told me it was a wing, told me where to get it, told me what the purpose was for it to bounce the light. And so I bought that. And... I felt like early on my pictures in the arena were better than what they would have been had I not had that wing and the flash that I had. So that was the primary reason of using a flash. Uh, but like even at Rockstar, I started with a flash and I slowly graduated to getting rid of it because the old building had amazing lighting and I didn't really need it. Um, so it just came down to what aesthetic I wanted and how well the lighting is. Like, for example, at the last um, uh, OWA Up shows, um, I had an off-camera flash 
I had two uh, like speed lights on poles. I saw and that. And I was using that, and it gave the pictures a different kind of look. Like if you look at the OWA pictures, like there's different shadows and things like that on those pictures versus uh, the up pictures halfway through the show, my batteries died and I just didn't care to replace them. <laughs> That's great. Well, <laughs> I, I really enjoy your pictures. Um, you know, I think that's been a big part of, you know, I don't know. The social media world's a big part of my life. I know it's a part of your life as well. And, and seeing your photos after each show and getting some in my inbox every once in a while has always been a treat, man. It's always been a blast. And I know uh, even Trey Lamar would, would have to say, you know, thank you for doing that. Um, I, I know what my favorite picture of yours is uh, that you've ever taken. What, what's your favorite picture that you've ever taken? Ah. Uh. Recently, I mean, or or, oh, or not, you know, oh, it doesn't... ever is probably the one that um, uh, the one that uh, Swerve Video came up to me and knew me from um, when I was still taking pictures in the crowd at IWA. Um, I took a picture of Mance after like he was coming to the ring. It was like uh, round uh, two or three or something of. Uh, uh, I believe it was uh, Prince of the Death, which means it was like Mance's first death match in his first death match tournament. So he's covered in blood. He's got one of those goofy looks in his face and he's just walking to the ring. Um, recently, somebody like a couple months ago messaged me for that picture and they put it on a flag. Um, I actually got one of the flags uh, on my ceiling upstairs, but it's, just one of those things where like I always whenever I tweet at man so I always put the parallels of we both were people nobody knew who we were when he got to IWA when I started taking pictures and granted he's a lot further along in his career than I may be uh, but we both you know branched out and started moving up and getting better at what we're doing um, so that's a picture that definitely sticks out because the first time I went to Glory Pro, Swerve Video was uh, doing the video work for them. And he seen me. He's like, your mouse. You took that picture of man's bloody. I was like, yeah. And it just I was shocked. <laughs> like, OK, somebody knows who I am. Hey, man, you're you're well known uh, for better or worse, you know, and, and uh, <laughs> I've you know, one of the things that I always do and well, you know, it hasn't come up that often anymore because I don't meet as many new people as I used to. But whenever I met photographers from or, or, or wrestlers from over here, I would always kind of tell them about you and kind of try to get them on your radar to some extent, because I feel like that, you know, you are someone who helps a wrestler's career, period. And that's kind of what you know, the road home from wrestling is all about is we want to help people's careers if we can. And, uh, you know, you've done that in spades. I mean, you've helped our broadcast career quite a bit just by taking a few pictures and retweeting some stuff. And I know you've, uh, had people listen to our show and stuff like that. And I really appreciate it. Um, you know, how's that feel when you see someone like Mance Warner or, you know, I, Nolan Edwards just showed up out of nowhere? You know what I mean? And, and yeah, he's a tremendous worker and, and he's a great kid, but his association with you has certainly helped him in his career uh, recently. I mean, how do you feel about wrestlers being able to have success just by knowing you and the things that you do for them? Well, the way I look at it, if anything I do helps anybody that's great. Um, everything that I do, I look at it on how, how would I want somebody to try? Um, like if there's somebody out there that can give my kid a leg up, by all means, please do it. Um, it's literally at this point, one of the reasons why I even still care to, you know, take pictures or put wear and tear on my car or anything like that is to help my kid and help the people that I've made friends with that are still trying to take that next step. Uh, for example, a person like Freddie, Freddie Hudson. Um, I've done as much as I can to try to help him. So I've gotten him into places that he otherwise would go, um, helped him get a couple opportunities here and there along the way from him just being there. So he's gotten to experience stuff that he probably wouldn't have experienced for another few years had he not 
bet on himself and got in a car with me. Um, so like you said, with a person like Nolan Edwards, here's a kid who first time I remember meeting him was the show I put on in October. He rode up with a bunch of the Tennessee guys. Only thing I know is uh, Righteous Jesse comes up to me and says, hey, uh, Impact guy uh, wants to be in the uh, Rumble Scramble thing. Okay, he needs to go talk to Slade. I didn't know. I thought that was his wrestling gimmick. Impact uh, <laughs> wrestling guy. I didn't realize that Jesse was telling me that he works for Impact. I was like, oh, okay. I found that out, like, I think the next month. Uh, we might have had something else to go do. And then that's when I found out that Jesse was telling me that he worked for them. And then, you know, you start watching the kid wrestle and you start looking at the content that the kid creates. I think right now this kid's the total package. Once this kid gets, you know, a few more matches underneath his belt and starts building that brand a little bit more, we're going to hear a kid's name all over the place because there's only one other person I've ever really met that can edit a video in the way he does direct somebody in the way he does to make you care about that match. That person that can do that outside of Nolan is J Rose. Um, simply just look at what J Rose did with the video for uh, Alley Cat versus uh, Nick Gage. I forgot that show was happening in Texas until J Rose did that video and they put it out. And then it's like, Oh, I'm kind of hyped up for this. Alley Cat versus Nick Gage match. He did the same thing with Alley Cat versus Mance, which it was actually both him and Nolan that worked on that video. Nolan was the camera guy behind that video. J Rose edited everything together with the brains of Alley Cat and Mance. And, but it made you care about Alley Cat versus Mance. It made you forget, oh, they've already wrestled each other before in Black Label. You completely forgot about that, but you knew it's like the first time they were going to wrestle or something. So it's just cool watching people like that create and no one's got that. And I think that kid's going to do some amazing things. And it's, it's just amazing how he is. Like, I don't know if you've ever talked about to talk to that kid or talked to him in the past few months, but here's a kid who had a job for a wrestling company that's on TV. He was helping make their product and record their videos and edit their product and getting it on TV every Tuesday he bet on himself because he wanted to be a wrestler. He didn't want to be a video editor. He wanted to be a wrestler. So that kid left his job, became a nomad to be a wrestler. Um, he spent a week with us while he was trying to figure things out just so he could be a wrestler. I don't know many young kids that, ex that are out there trying to do it right now that are willing to go homeless, jobless, or anything like that to be a wrestler. Like, I'm probably telling more than that kid wants anybody to know, but that kid's betting on himself. And I admire that because there's not many that I've ever met that will do it. You try to ask some of these kids to go hit a seminar or drive to help set up and tear down at a show, they're going to hit you with the, I don't have no gas, I have no way, because they have zero hustle about what they do. But no one's one of those kids that he will find a way and he will do it. There's not many like that. I met him uh, at an unsanctioned pro show and uh, I started talking to him and I, and I just asked him, I said, well, who the heck are you? I, I never heard of you. And now you show up out of nowhere and you're everywhere. And that's kind of how wrestling works sometimes. It's like, you know, these guys just show up out of nowhere and then all of a sudden they're everywhere. Um, and he told me, you know, his story and something that you failed to mention is that he's not from America. He's from Canada. Right. right? You know, he's a he, he moved to another country, um, you know, to do uh, something that he loves. And, and that's you got to respect the shit out of that, uh, like you said. And uh, and, and another point uh, to what you were just saying there is some of the most successful pro wrestlers in the world uh, right now did it the way that he's kind of doing it. And what I mean is, is that these guys that can edit, that can direct, that can wrestle. Um, there's two guys that have been doing that for like a year and a half now, and now they have their own promotion and that's uh, the young bucks. You know, that's kind of how they built their career from already being kind of like near the top of the independent scene to where they are now is by making their own videos, directing their own stuff and telling stories that the fans cared about in a way that, you know, is a little different than everybody else. So I think that's a huge inspiration. What do you think about 
you know, the success of how becoming a wrestler has changed. It's, you know, it's a different way. There's a different path now to get where you want to go. What what do you think about all that? I think it's amazing. It's given us more content. Uh, Take a look at a person like Warhorse or a person like Dan Housen Raffi, the three most viral guys out there right now created their buzz, created their momentum going forward from creating content. You you know as well as I know. Uh, two years ago, three years ago almost, we were watching Dan Housen get his ass kicked by Dustin Rays and Alex Colon almost every week. He was stuck in a tag team with Pompano Joe, just constantly getting chopped and dropped on his damn head. <laughs> the kid leaves because, you know, it's like I can't afford to come down here every Wednesday for, you know, very little pay because I'm at the bottom. Um, he works his way into AIW, gets um, himself involved with the production, and it was something that fit his personality. So he started morphing himself at that point, you know, added paint, added the uh, creepy spookiness to his character, which fit what the production was, you know, starting to transform into. And then he started making videos. Like once he started making those weird, creepy videos in his basement or whatever, it started catching people's attention. It started catching on. Then as a little bit more caught on, he started adding to it and adding to it and adding to it. And like some of the stuff that I feel like he's been adding to it has been happy accidents that got over, which is some of the best things in the world when you didn't even mean for something to become such a sensation, but it just happened. Like, uh, I believe, weren't you there for the first, you know, tequila spot that he does? I, I wasn't, but I've, I've been there for many of the after ones, you know, and that, that, I believe the first time he did that was at the, the bar show, uh, yeah. you know, uh, so. From what I was told, he walked in, he seen the bar, he said, he, they said he went up to the people, said, can I get on the bar? They said, okay. And then he asked <laughs> if they had the tequila song and he just did it and it worked. And now it's they've been incorporated in some way on every show he's done after. It's just amazing to watch people go from just another guy to they can carve their own path of where they want to go. It's the same way with Warhorse. Uh, the first time I met that dude, or the first time I seen that dude was probably about five or six years ago. He was another guy in the car coming to IWA when IWA was running Colgate Gym in Clarksville, Indiana. Um, He started off as just a guy, then became part of Viking War Party, and he was the littlest Viking. Just a dude in fuzzy kick pads, uh, going ha, ha, or hey, or whatever (laughs) all the time. Then he broke from that and just started having killer match after killer match after killer match. Still, nobody was, you know, saying he is what he is now. They're just like, oh, he's having great matches. He started cutting promos. Like, all of a sudden, the, the guy starts screaming. He starts saying, I'm no longer Jake Parnell. I'm Warhorse, all caps, because all I do is talk and, and a yell. And transformed his, his basement or garage or whatever into his promo space, his gym, and whatever else he needs it to be. Like, that background that you see in his videos is something he made. That's literally on his wall. And he... Like, how many people are going to invest the time and effort to do that? But he started putting content out, and people start gravitating towards it. Like, if you go back and just watch everything he's done at Black Label for the past two years, he's been having amazing matches. Like, this guy's had matches with uh, Josh Briggs. Um, He's had matches with uh, uh, Fred Yehi. Like, just tons of great matches. Like, really good matches. But once he started screaming and becoming a character more than he was people gravitated to. And that's one of those things that I think sometimes people forget fans want to invest in a character, like because find that character, find that thing that works like the wrestling will eventually come if you keep practicing at it, but you got to figure out a niche that helps you. Um, like, I think that's where like the beauty of us being able to go to Rockstar so often as we did was a lot of those kids were able to figure out characters or things about them that worked because they had a crowd to work in front of every week. 
they had a big show that was like a pay-per-view every month and they got to practice on characters and characters and characters the same way like look at crash jackson working weekly and working big shows every month that kids found a confidence that he didn't have the first time we probably seen him like when he was a uh, generic guy number three coming to iwa he didn't have that confidence that he has now and it's just amazing to watch these kids develop and figure stuff out. It's it's fun to watch people make it happen, you know, and, and that's the thing. No one's going to do it for you. You got to make it happen. And, uh, you know, you're right. I mean, you, all those people you mentioned have been really fun to watch. And, you know, I've said it many times. One of, you know, my favorite ultimate fan experience is seeing a wrestler grow and whether that's you know, uh, one week he doesn't botch that move that he botched last week, or it's, you know, seeing them on television and everything in between is like my favorite shit. I just love to see guys grow. Who's somebody that you've gotten to see grow lately um, that has been a surprise for you? Or maybe we should just talk about Billy Starks and talk about how awesome she is and how much she's grown in just a year and a half or whatever. A uh, person that's recently started surprising me is uh, Jonathan Wolf. Uh, me and that kid have a love-hate relationship <laughs> because I'm not too nice to him. Um, like a year ago, I think I asked him, what do you want out of this? What do you want out of wrestling? He looked at me and said, I want to live off of it. I asked him, what are you doing to do that? He's like, honestly, nothing. I was like, are you going to the gym? Man, I tried. It's just as boring. And then you don't really see results right away. So I just get bored with it and stop. Well, you're not going to see results unless you keep going. And like, I started coming down on him. I'm like, dude, like, if you want this, go get it. And like, you know, he kept coming up with excuse after excuse after, after excuse. I think something that changed was this past August, we all went down to SCI, the Scenic City Invitational. Um, we all stayed in the same hotel, stuff like that. And he was just there to show face, to help out, because they had a bad showing during the future show the year before. They had a tag team come up that just didn't gel with them. And there was things that were said that was attributed to IFHY, stuff that they didn't say, but people didn't know who said it. And so they felt like none of the promoters liked them. So this year, they were given an opportunity because Violence is Forever said, hey, we're here early. Uh, there's nothing for us to do because we just don't want to sit around and watch wrestling. Give us IFHY. Uh, Wolf and Kemp were on their way to go get some um, chicken nuggets from uh, Chick-fil-A. I'm calling them and messaging Wolf like, yo, get back here. Y'all got a match. Wolf was like, man, I'm hungry. But they came back. They got dressed. They went out and had their match. Wolf decided to kill himself, um, which he contributed to being uh, hangry. But <laughs> the kid went out there and showed heart and his want to get over that the promoters loved. Fast forward to later that night, they're doing a podcast with all of them. And one of the promoters that books SCI is in there. And Wolf, without thinking, says, I want to be in SCI next year. I don't want to be on the future show. I don't want to be a, just a match on the show. I want to be in the tournament. And, of course, Billy follows, you know, suit. Stacey saying she wants to be part of the weekend in some way. Not just there to help out. Not just there to support her friends. Not just there as a person being there. She wanted to be part of it, whether it's futures or whatever, it's whatever. Literally in a room full of wrestlers, they were the only two who spoke up and said that they wanted this. They wanted to be part of this. No one else really said anything. So the promoter speaks up and he says, hey, uh, for transparency or whatever, or just so you know, we, we start booking the show immediately as soon as the, that when tonight ends. He's like, we're already looking at who do we want for next year? So you never know who we watching or what we're listening for or what we're going to do. Fast forward to October, Wolf was put into a scramble match. The winner got the first spot in SCI. 
So Wolf got what he said he wanted, and it took him putting it in the universe and having matches that mattered for these people to see, and he got it. Like, not many people can say, this is what I want and get it. And this is, like I said, a year ago where they thought these guys hated them. Now they're loved by these guys because they see the effort that they're starting to put in. And it's just amazing to watch this kid turn that corner from being, you know, just, oh, I've been wrestling since I was like three. I kind of know how to do this and kind of good at it and just going through the motions to now I want people to care about what I'm doing. I want to hit the road and get to me places that I can be. Like the kid's been working several GCWs over the past couple months. Um, he's booked for quite a few things at Mania this year. And this is a kid last year that was just a kid there hoping for an opportunity. Now he's going down there knowing he's got guaranteed spots at different places. Like, it's just amazing to watch a lot of those kids go from, we're just a group hanging out. Like last year, I was uh, scheduled to shoot the IWTV reunion show. Everybody in IFHY and my family came with me to the show. Um, a promoter said everybody who's not part of production or not you know, booked on the show needs to get out of the building until the show starts. So they decided to go to you know, um, a food court at a mall to eat, and they started watching the show from you know, cell phones. So here goes where these kids are watching from cell phones to they're part of the madness this year. To me, that's coolest shit in the world. It's pretty awesome. And, uh, you know, it's been a lot of fun to see Jonathan Wolf specifically grow as a wrestler because you're right. I, I, you know, when we first saw him three years ago, he, he was a guy who I was like, Oh, that guy could be pretty good. Um, doesn't look like he cares to be, you know, but uh, he could be pretty good. And now he's putting the effort in and he's one of the best guys in this area. Um, you know, and part of that's natural talent, but a lot of it's really hard work. And it, it's good to see guys like him, you know, putting in the work. Now, your daughter, uh, Billy Starks, has gone from someone who used to ride with shows to you or sh with shows two shows with you. In fact, um, years ago, I was at a Ring of Honor show. And um, I was there by myself. My friend was supposed to go. Actually, Dean's brother was supposed to go, and he bailed on me. So I had two seats. And, uh, you know, I posted some pictures from that show, like, uh, about a year, two years ago. And you guys, you and Billy were sitting right behind me as very, you know, the, the promoter from WTF was there. Um, like, half the crowd from Rockstar was there. Jamie Coy was there. There was, like, all these people. And I didn't, like, Doug, I think, from PPW was there. And I didn't know any of you. And now I know all of you. It's amazing how that happens. How has this journey been with Billy Starks? This had to have started as something that's like, okay, I mean, you want to wrestle. And now what she's doing now, it's fucking nuts. Well, it's one of those things. Uh, from the time I met her, she was like three. They had Her and her brother had no clue what wrestling was. They weren't into it. Um, she was into her anime cartoons. Her brother was into going into the neighbor's garage. So I started watching wrestling whenever I was at the house, and she would sit down and watch with me. It would be wrestling, CSI, or Law and Order. Um, she would, as she started getting into it, she would constantly say, "I want to be a wrestler. I want to be a wrestler." Then it morphed to, "I want to be a wrestler, or I want to be a criminal investigator, or I want to be an ice cream truck driver." And then sometimes she wanted to fight in the UFC. So, you know, we would always tell her, you go to college, we'll pay for wrestling school wherever you go to college at. Um, we were at some show and I was picking at Madman Pondo. I was like, hey, Pondo, when are you going to start training my kid? He looked at me and said, I ain't got no ring. You need to go talk to Tony. He pulls Too Tough Tony over and says, Tony, Mouse wants to talk to you. I was like, hey, my kid wants to be a wrestler. I hear you train people. He was like, yeah, we train uh, Mondays and Wednesdays, uh, he said. And then we trained Sundays before the show. He's like, bring her on a Monday or Wednesday. She can check out a class. I was like, well, just a heads up. She's in school. <laughs> like School, school, like not college. He was like, eh, that's okay. It's Indiana. So <laughs> we, went, 
So we went to the school. Uh, we she sat there. She watched. Um, the trainer that night was uh, Rudy Switchblade. He comes over and he's like, "Hey, do you want to get in the ring and you know touch the ropes, fall down or whatever?" And she's like, "Yeah." So she got in the ring. She started doing stuff. I looked at her mom. She ain't never getting out of this thing. <laughs> so after practice, they came over. They talked money. They talked schedule. He talked proper shoes because she was uh, running around in the ring in her cheerleading shoes. He was like, those aren't going to work. She needs either boots or, you know, amateur wrestling shoes or something like that. But she started training uh, May of like uh, 2018, um, had her first match October of 2018, and now has pretty much knocked almost everything of whatever kind of list she has out. Uh, because one of the beauties of traveling around, taking pictures and meeting people, she's been right there with me, which means she's met these people, which these people in turn fall in love with the little girl that's in love with wrestling and they see her passion. So when they find out that she was training or that she was a wrestler, they would all you know, vie to be, you know, her first or second or third or whatever match. Like one of those people that early on wanted a match with her, uh, which was the very first person she told she was training was Samantha Heights. Like when she started training, we went to a rock star. So she gave Samantha a hug like she normally does when we get there. She said, oh, I started training at Grindhouse. Samantha immediately grabbed her, hugged her, and then took her over to Dave to tell Dave that she started training. Then she said, I want to be your first match. Unfortunately, that didn't happen, but Samantha did make the drive three hours to be there on Lily's first match night. Like, that's a bond that they were able to establish because here's this little girl who followed her stepdad to take pictures and became friends with somebody that she looked up to. And so, like, Samantha did manage to become, I think, like her third match, her first match on Girl Fight. And I can't wait for them to wrestle again, of course, whenever Samantha's healthy enough to do it, because the progress that Billy has made from that match to where she is probably now is amazing. So I can't imagine what they're going to be able to do with each other. Um, but there's something about her that I don't think there's anybody on this planet right now that will outwork this little girl, which is part sad. And to me, it should be part motivating for most people. Here goes a kid who has honor classes in high school, tons of homework. She goes to practice at least two to three times a week and then has multiple bookings on the weekend. Um, example being this past weekend, uh, Blue she didn't take a booking on Friday because we had to go to grandmother's 90th birthday. She had a booking on Saturday where she wrestled twice. She had a booking yesterday where she wrestled once. After that booking yesterday, because it was an afternoon show, she went to practice and practiced for about two or three hours with Wolf and the rest of the Indianapolis kids. Came home, didn't get home to probably about 1130 midnight or so. Woke up at about 5 a.m. to get ready for school, had to be at her bus by about 6. Got home from school today, probably took a little nap, and now she's at practice tonight. She'll be at practice for open ring tomorrow, be at practice on Wednesday. Then she has to travel to Alabama or, like, the Alabama-Tennessee border for a show on Friday. Then she has to travel to Spencer, Indiana on Saturday. And then she has to travel to Indianapolis, Indiana on Sunday. So I don't think that anybody can match the amount of work that this kid puts in throughout the week. And that's not counting all the homework that she has to do this week because her mom won't let her wrestle unless she gets her homework done and maintains A's, which she does. Yeah, and you've used all this to put wrestling and wrestlers to shame. You've shamed other wrestlers uh, quite a bit by, uh, you know, kind of putting this information out there about like, uh, uh, you know, using your words, how a little girl is outworking all these guys and, you know, and uh, I think there's a lot of uh, lessons to be learned there and a lot of inspiration to be had. 
Uh, one of the folks that has helped her out uh, quite a bit, from my understanding, um, is Adam Slade. What kind of role has he played in uh, in helping Billy along in the ring, and uh, and what kind of role has he played in your life? Because I know he's he's a special guy, and he's a hell of a dude. Well, uh, I met Slade um, when they were coming in from PWF, whenever they were still kind of one foot in over at OBW. Um, what Slade's doing now is what he tried to build back in those days with um, the crew of OBW kids that came, but those kids just weren't ready to hit the road yet. Um, so this dude started betting on him stuff and started hitting the road, and then he started spending more time hitting the road with me. So we travel around a lot, and he's literally morphed into one of my best friends. Like, I would have probably died in a car and gone to sleep had this dude not sacrifice sleep or whatever to stay up and just bullshit with me on you know nine hour drives you know to and from you know Iowa or you know Tennessee or you know Ohio or wherever we're going like this dude's grinding and wants it so whenever I started doing open ring on Tuesdays one of the very first people and one of the most consistent people that comes to these open ring times is Slade um, literally every Tuesday, it's two people there, Slade and and Billy. Um, I tell other kids about it. They don't show up. Um, it's one of the reasons why I detest my local area so much, because everybody wants to be a wrestler until it's time to be a wrestler. They don't want to put in the work. Like, it's it's very sickening and sad. Like, every time you say something to somebody about, hey, why aren't you showing up? Oh, I ain't got the money or uh, um, I just don't have time. I got to work. Like here goes Slade, a dude who works a full-time job, a dude who spends a lot of time on the weekends traveling in the hopes of an opportunity. He goes out whether he's booked or not, which is something that some of these kids don't do. Some of these kids aren't going to go to a show unless they have a guarantee and a promise of a booking. If they're just going to set up a ring to make, you know, interactions or network with the promoter, that ain't happening. Slade does that every weekend. Um, recently, he started going to AIW with um, some members of the Lost Boys and Calvin Tankman. Um, like I said, he's gone to Iowa to Revolver several times with me. Um, one time in particular that stands out is um, this past show in December, he went to Revolver with me. Um, they Everybody tore down the ring. But there was one thing that they forgot we should probably take that down to, which was the entrance. So as people start dispersing because they all have six plus hours, nine hours, however many hours drives ahead of them, me and Slater are the only ones still there. Granted, I'm a lazy piece of shit, so I'm not tearing anything down or picking anything up. So I'm sitting there watching this dude tear this entrance down by himself. I look at one of the members of the management of revolver. And I said, Hey, you see that? He's like, yeah. His response was, I ain't the one you probably need to be talking to. My response was, I know that, but you have a better chance of getting that person to respond. than I do. He's like, true. He's like, that's Adam Slade, right? I said, yes. So when the person in question that makes those big decisions comes through, which is Sammy, Sammy starts folding up a banner. I start helping him. I said, hey, you see that? He looked over. He said, that's Adam, right? I was like, yeah. I was like, he's been doing that by himself because everybody left. He was like, I know. He was like, tell him to send me some footage and I'll take a look. I'll see what I can do. Then he also went up to, to Adam and told him himself, said, hey, send me some footage. Let me see your footage. I will take a look and I'll see what I can, what I can do. Like, he's seen this dude wants it. Like, everybody else left. He was by himself. And this ain't the first time I've seen him do that. He did it at Black Label. Like, he swept the entire floor while everybody else was running out to get their food or get home or whatever it is. Like, there's not many people that are, you know, in this business that are going to do what he's going to do and keep doing it. Like, they're going to go maybe try to shake hands and meet people one time. They don't get nothing out of it. They're not going back. This dude goes back every time. Like, even Gary J looked at him one day and was like, 
man, it's at a point where it's time for you to stop just being here, helping out and time for people to start using you. So Gary told him, like, if you ever are coming to anarchy or something like that, give me a heads up and I see what I can do. And like, he's helped him. Like uh, he, the last anarchy show, he put him on pre-show. And it's one of those things where this dude is busting his ass. I wish more people would give him an opportunity. Like he adds value to their show and like is, he's only getting better. And, and like I tell him all the time, the one thing that started helping him get better, he start leaving this God forsaken area. <laughs> like you can only get so better wrestling the same people every damn week. Like, how am I going to get better if I'm wrestling the same folks? Once he started going up to WCWO where he could figure himself out, he started getting better. Then he started getting in the cars and going different places and working different people and figuring stuff out. And like anytime he doesn't really have anything going that weekend, if I say, Hey Slade, we're going here. Okay. I got you mouse. We're going like, Literally, the following week after after the Mania week that we're going to have, this dude agreed to go on what we're going to call Death Weekend with me. We're going to go to Columbus, Ohio to shoot, so I can shoot uh, the first night of Pier. Then we're going to go to Pittsburgh, so I can shoot night two. Then we're going to turn around, and we're driving to Nashville, so we can be at Seth Grabs. Like, this dude agreed to that weekend with me. The last time he agreed to a crazy weekend like that, we drove to Iowa, drove back home, zero sleep, and then drove to Unsanctioned Pro. Literally just amped up on energy drinks and Jeff Hardy's entrance music. I remember, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like, we we got lucky because Myron's like, hey, I need you to give me a ride home. All right, you're driving. We're going to sleep. Because we were dead. But it's one of those things. This dude's drive and love for wrestling requires him to do this stuff so like his love from wrestling is matched with the love that billy has to get back to your original question they feed off each other like if you actually sit down and talk to that little girl she probably has a better mind for wrestling than most people so she will go over with slade on what she thinks is cool or what would work or what he should try to do and she helps him come up with things that he wants to try in the ring and vice versa. He helps her like try this, do this. Like they probably have had more practice spot matches and things like that than anybody else that either one of them's ever wrestled. And they feed off each other because it's literally in most cases, just those two at open ring. They spend about three hours every Tuesday in that ring. And I'm just over in the corner playing on my phone, editing photos while they're doing stuff. Every once in a while, I get bored and go pop off a PCL style moonsault. But other than that, I'm staying out of the way and letting them do what they do. Awesome. Well, I hope it's a double moonsault because I know you can do it, you know. Um, oh, my but... phone don't allow me to do that. <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, I think Adam Slade is great. And this is the same guy, uh, speaking of getting out of that godforsaken area, as you mentioned, um, you know, this is a guy that Rip Rogers called a cancer to pro wrestling. Um, yeah, and, uh, you know, it just goes to show you that, you know, uh, pro wrestling is about, you know, being open to things. You know, that's a big part of it. If you can, if you go to a show just as a fan alone and you're closed minded, you're not going to have a good time. If you go and you're open minded, you're going to love everything, you know, and uh, it, it you'll like some things more than others. And I think that, you know, the older generation of pro wrestling uh, fans and wrestlers have a real closed minded uh, approach to pro wrestling. And uh, another thing about the area over there, and I'm not trying to just you know, shit on Indiana. Cause I've had a lot of great you know, times in Indiana. I met you in Indiana, you know, but is that working in front of the same crowd every week is important, but only when they tell you what they like and don't like by reacting, you know? And so sometimes working in front of the same crowd at the arena, for example, every week where they just sit there and they don't, they don't clap, they don't do anything, you know, that doesn't even help you as a wrestler other than kind of, you know, getting better at the moves, but it doesn't help you work a crowd. So you're right. You know, to anyone who's listening to this that only works at the arena, which that's changed a lot recently, which is good. It's just you got to get out to these other places because, you know, you're not you're not getting any reception, good or bad sometimes. And that that's uh, that's death for a wrestler. Right. 
Well, I think part of the issues with people working across this area is they don't work the crowd. Um, because I've seen people like MJF come out and elicit a reaction from the people in this area. Like uh, one of the last times that he was here, I believe he wrestled uh, Kevin Giza. And I watched MJF literally make a guy jump the barricade, get ready to fight him, and Harbo had to run over and stop it. Um, so I think it comes down to the person, their ability, and their belief in what they do. And a lot of these kids don't have a belief in what they do. They don't have belief in what their character is or how to get their character over or things that they're supposed to do. Um, they do mimics of what they think a certain persona is supposed to be. Like if they think that their character is supposed to be an asshole, they mimic what they think an asshole is. And since it's not real to them, the crowd doesn't care. Mm -hmm. um, it's one of those things that one of the things that IWA, for example, has always had is that if you can get over in front of their crowd, you can get over in front of any crowd. Hell, it's one of the things that's helped Mance be able to control and hold any crowd he's in front of in the palm of his hands. I guarantee when he's at MLW, that crowd's a lot easier to get a reaction out of than anybody that he's ever met through his years at IWA. Um, it's one of those things like organically watching that man go from the dude who picked fights with little kids to everybody loved him was amazing. Like he literally, for example, one of the first interactions he ever had with my stepson, he looked him in the face and said, I'm going to fuck you up, motherfucker. <laughs> and my stepson didn't know what to do. He just kind of looked at him and was like, oh, he's going to, oh, and just kind of sat down. And I'm looking at him like, why you say something back? <laughs> then he said something to him, and I believe uh, Mance turned around and told him to stay in school. Mance gets knocked off the barricade, and my stepson, like, froze. I was like, dude, that was your opportunity to look him in the face and say, you should have stayed in school. I was like, you <laughs> fell. But it's stuff like that. Then you fast forward, like, not even a year later, that's just one of his favorite wrestlers coming to IWA because he was able to manipulate that crowd and play their emotions and do what wrestlers also were supposed to do. Outside of doing everything in the ring, you're also supposed to be this bigger-than-life character, this, this person that they either believe in or they absolutely detest. And I think that's where a lot of people are missing that. And this godforsaken area, probably the best area to figure that out because you're not going to get easy boos, yays, or nays. You're going to get people who generally don't care because this area has seen everything. Like, you got to imagine the stuff that this area is. Like, Ian's been running in this area for damn near 30 damn years. So in that 30 years, they've seen CM Punk, Colt Cabana. They've seen ICP randomly in wrestling rings. They've seen, you know, Daniel Bryan versus AJ Styles. There was, like, think 30 people who witnessed that in New Albany, Indiana. So you got to think this area has seen it all. There's nothing you can bring to this area. So you got to figure out how do I give somebody who has everything? What do I give? You got to figure that out. And these people, some of these kids just haven't figured it out. Like hell, the first IWA show that I ever took uh, the kids to was a show during the middle of winter and one of the matches on there was Ricochet versus Jonathan Gresham. Like, middle of December in a snowstorm, we're watching Ricochet versus Jonathan Gresham in Colgate Gym. So what do you give an area? Like, what do you do to get a reaction when an area has seen that on a random Sunday in a snowstorm? That's a that's, fair that's point. Where, that's where this area is. And, like, I think people forget that. It's kind of like the uh, the evolution of – like Dayton, like that's another area that's seen everything. Like Sammy's got to do off the wall shit just to keep packing that building. So he's got to do bigger and better the next time. The same thing with, with Rockstar. They're in the process of morphing to something that they weren't before to try to figure out how do they keep, you know, maintaining where they are or getting better with what they are now. Because you have people who see everything. Um, that's why, like, Unsanctioned Pro, I enjoy watching the crowd there because those people love everything. 
and it's amazing to watch. Like I, at this point, I've seen all types of wrestling and taking pictures of everything. I don't pay attention to the wrestling anymore. While I'm taking pictures, I'm more listening to the crowd and seeing if they're reacting to stuff because that excites me more than what's going on in the ring. That's a very good point you make there, which is one of the reasons why I love talking to you, man. You know, uh, you're often right, you know, which is uh, a good thing to be. Uh, We're coming up on an hour here. And I know we could do two more hours, but uh, I try to keep these around an hour. But before we go, um, you know, one, do you have any questions for me? What happened to your new Obney or your Southern Indiana crew? Did Ralph them just give up on wrestling? Well, I think that, um, you know, things happen that uh, make being a fan there difficult, I think, at times. And also... You know, I think uh, folks just have better things to do sometimes. And uh, not everyone, as you know, not everyone is going to be as dedicated as I am to going to every fucking show that I can possibly go to and, uh, you know, and recording a podcast about it. It's it's a commitment. It's not just, you know, people think it's easy. You go to the show and then you talk about it and and it's not easy. There's a lot that goes into it. And and I, I have to admit that, um, you know, it's harder to enjoy a show if you're taking mental notes and physical notes about every single thing that happened and trying to figure out where all the puzzle pieces fit together and the story that's being told and you become more analytical about it. And it can affect your uh, fan fandom of pro wrestling. So I think uh, it's just a combination of all those kinds of things, I think. And uh, we uh, we are open, you know, for applications. If someone wants to uh, start covering Southern Indiana for us, that would be an absolute blast. That was my original idea for the road home from wrestling is to open chapters in different parts of the country. Um, and we did get that a little bit, but it it's difficult to ask people to have the same commitment that I do. I get it. Okay. Any- so next question. Yeah, bring it on. What am I going to see Gary again? Who, Gary? Oh man. Well, you just saw him, didn't you? I don't see Gary enough. You got to think <laughs> how much I was seeing Gary. I miss Gary. Dude, Gary's my boy. We all miss Gary. Uh, you're speaking, of course, of, uh, you know, sometimes co-host of the Road Home from Wrestling podcast and, you know, partially founding member, uh, legendary Gary B, who only shows up every once in a while. And when he does, it's always a surprise. Um, you know, Gary, uh, you know, we changed ownership a couple times and Gary was, uh, you know, signed to a Legends contract by the Shovel Boys, which means that they're paying him to stay at home. So he only shows up every once in a while, and when he does, it's a huge pop, my friend. So that that's the reason. Uh, whatever. I want to see Gary. I know, buddy. Me too. I, you know, I just saw Gary at the uh, – Dean has his uh, annual Royal Rumble party, other co-host of the Root Home from Wrestling podcast. And, uh, you know, I saw Gary there, had a good old time hanging out with him. And uh, if you don't know Gary, everyone who knows Gary, their life is better for knowing Gary. Let's just put it that way. I think I'm going to start spamming Gary's uh, Twitter. Do it. Yeah, he checks it like once a week, you know, so (laughs) he'll get in there. Uh, Any other questions for me, my friend? No, just keep doing what you're doing, buddy. I will. I will. Now, are there any other photographers you want to plug, and then we'll get to your social media and all that stuff uh, before we before we wrap this up? But is there anybody else that you want to talk about out there that's taking pictures? Yeah, there's uh, Earl Garner who has a book that he made um, a collection of photos from last year's collection uh, collective. Uh, He shoots out of New Jersey. Amazing guy. I love that guy. Uh, There's Chris Grasso um, who also shoots out of New Jersey. Um, He's got a book. um, I believe it's on um, Amazon. For some reason it's slipping my mind what it's called, but it's about deathmatch wrestling. Um, If you find it, it's got like a picture of a bloody Matt Tremont on it. Um, then there's uh, there's just so many. Uh, there's Dory uh, that's been kind of hanging around me for whatever reason. I don't know why. Um, I wouldn't hang around me. Uh, she's getting better and better. Um, every time she goes out and shoots, she's pretty much transitioned and been the primary shooter at uh, Paradigm. Uh, she recently just shot um, uh, Anarchy. Uh, she's also was the reason for my. Twitter rant a couple of days ago, yelling at people about giving photographers fucking credit. Um, 
Then there's uh, Corey Tatum um, out of Atlanta. Um, he's uh, one of the reasons I was able to get into Ring of Honor and have been shooting there for like two years. Uh, there is who else? Who else? Some good people. Well, I mean, there's just so many. Like, there's like if you just literally go to Instagram or Twitter or Facebook and you just type in a wrestling photography, you're going to find somebody. Oh, another person that's great. Uh, Ichiban Drunk. Hell, that's the reason I even bought a camera. Say that again slower. Ichiban Drunk. Uh, he's a photographer that shoots out of uh, Michigan. He shoots a lot of uh, like freelance things like that. That's pretty awesome. Well, uh, you know, I really appreciate it. And I just want to let you know, my um, photography um, career is blooming as well. Um, my uh, a picture that I took at, at uh, Memphis uh, years ago of Cole Radrick was just recently used on the Lost Boys. It's not customs. It's it's a show poster uh, that's going on in um, in Florida. You believe that? And they didn't even give me credit. You should have yelled at him, but don't worry about it. I'm getting that show shut down. Um, oh, I'm totally going to get a shut down. I'm going to be one of those, uh, like that meme of the lady calling uh, 911 on the uh, cookout. That's going to be me. I don't want this show to happen anymore. I want it shut down. I'm getting it taken care of. Well, I mean, as the leader of the Lost Boys, that should be pretty simple, right? No, they don't listen to me. Oh, all right. Well, that's a mistake, you know. Listening to you has uh, got me pretty far, so I, I appreciate it. Uh, where can folks find you on the internet where they can hear more of your uh, shenanigans and, and fun ramblings and and just you know straight up hate towards Trey Lamar? Uh, on Twitter, I'm WCW Mouse three nine one one. Mouse's Wrestling Adventures on Instagram. Um, if you want to try to fin request me on Facebook. I might not accept it. I got a whole bunch of them that I'm ignoring right now. So don't worry about that. Um, but more important, follow people I care about. So follow Adam Slade on uh, Twitter. Follow Billy Starks on Twitter. Follow Jonathan Wolf on Twitter. Sean Kemp on Twitter. Don't follow Cole Radrick because he's a uh, broken foot Johnson and he did not help drive back from Atlantic City, so I don't like him. Um, you can follow Trey Lamar, but eh. Uh, follow Lee Moriarty because he's amazing. He's going to be literally the best technical wrestler in the world in a couple of years. Uh, follow Nolan Edwards because he's now, I guess, my my most recent child I've gotten. Uh, you can follow Freddie Hudson. Um, follow whoever you want to follow. Follow Aaron Williams because he needs yeah. more people and he needs to be booked more places. I like that guy. Aaron Williams rules. Um, you know, he's the man. I think that's kind of... It's interesting. I, you know, we came out to IWA because Aaron invited us out. And then I met you and Aaron, and then I talked to Aaron and Aaron said, yeah, that guy's, that guy's okay. And I was like, all right, you got the Aaron Williams seal of approval. I can now be your friend, you know? And, uh, he's like a litmus test for people, you know? So, uh, which I really like that about him. And, uh, you know, it's been a lot of fun, man. I, I can't thank you enough for all the fun, uh, that we've had and all the, uh, help that you've given me over the years. Cause a lot of people don't know, um, you know, a lot of the stuff that you do behind the scenes uh, for pro wrestling in all the areas, not just your area, in every area. And it's been a, a, a good time getting to know you and just kind of seeing all these people grow, like I said, including yourself. So I really appreciate it. Um, you know, folks can follow me at Drucifer Tweets and follow our show at the Road Home FW. Any any uh, closing comments you have, Mouse? Um. I hope this area gets better. Well, you're doing everything you can to make that happen. So, um, but uh, probably well, gonna go buy some uh, gasoline and just burn it down later. <laughs> All right. Well, if you guys uh, are see a fire in the uh, southern Indiana area, you know, uh, just leave it, let it go, let it burn. You know, it's gonna be fine. But uh, for me and my guest, Mouse's Wrestling Adventure, Robert, uh, thank you so much for listening.